Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Sport Bite Fencing Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Stefano Lucchetti, a saber fencer representing the Argentine national team. With me today, all the way from Japan, is a really good friend, two-time na Japanese national champion, and training and hoping to qualify for Tokyo 2020, whenever. Um, Kaito Streets, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for being here. Hey, Stefano, thank you for having me. I'm super excited. I love podcasts, so yeah, I'm very excited. Thank you. Thank you, Kaido. It's, it's, an, it's a pleasure to have you. And uh, again, with this time difference, I appreciate you logging on after your long day of training and, and everything. I know the time difference is, is kind of crazy, so thanks again. Yeah, no problem. So I want to start off. We just mentioned that you're in Japan. How how has life been in Japan? How is it different? You know, you obviously grew up in the States, uh, for those that don't know. Uh, and like, can you just tell us how is the holiday season with Christmas only two days away, uh, New Year's in, in a few in next week? How is the holiday season? How is life? How is everything in Japan compared to US? So, yeah, I mean, I, I was born in Japan. I lived here until I was seven. So, you know, just had like a brief childhood here and then grew up in the U.S. until two years ago when I moved back. So I'm kind of still re relearning about the Japanese culture, especially about the holidays, uh, just about the people and the culture and everything. About Christmas, yeah, it's not, they celebrate Christmas here, but it's not as big as you would think, you know, other countries, and especially the U.S. They're big on New Year's, that's for sure, because, you know, it's, the start of a new year but um yeah living here uh I, I had a basic understanding of the culture so it wasn't a huge shock for, to me but just uh learning about the adult life here is quite interesting you know i, I only lived here when i was a kid so just yeah. having a different perspective which is fun you know absolutely how, how long ago did you move to japan so i moved back november 2018 it's so a little bit over two years ago. Yeah, yeah. And like, obviously we know <laughs> the basic food, sushi is, uh, and I'm a huge fan of sushi. And I remember when we went to the training camp in, in Oita, you took us to this uh, uh, really low key and not like super fancy, but again, for from where I'm coming from and everything, the sushi was fantastic what is your <laughs> what is your favorite japanese food and like what has been like a really fun or crazy experience that that you've ha had and you've gone through so far i mean food wise you know what people think of japan is right like you said sushi ramen um what else is there um god dang okay. Gyo like gyoza but no those things are you know very popular here as well but there's so many hidden uh, food that people should definitely try when they get the chance to come here, have an open mind. But, you know, my favorite food, I'll say, is, uh, I mean, I love to eat, you know, you know, I like to eat protein. So, you know, meat is a huge thing for me. So, yakiniku, which is uh, Japanese barbecue. You mm -hmm. know, if, if you know Korean barbecue, it's very similar. But um, I think Jap Japan focuses more on beef. I think Koreans focus more on pork, pork yeah. but uh, I mean, it's similar style. You know, we have our sides, you know, main dishes of meat and you have rice and soup and all that. But just the quality of the beef is, I think, different from what you get from other countries. And um, yeah, just unreal. And obviously, if you go to a fancier place, you get better quality meat and you can go to cheap ones, but they're still all good. Still good. Uh, is it is it really different than the stereotypical like Japanese hibachi and like the yeah yeah the, the, the hibachi thing doesn't food. really exist here. Uh -huh. That's like a Americanized Japanese show kind of food yeah. show. Um, we don't really have that here. I mean, there's probably like the, the restaurant like that, but I think it's run by like you know foreigners or only foreigners go. Um, yeah, yeah. There's no hibachi kind of thing. <laughs> I, I've never been in Japan. You know, that's more for entertainment, yeah. not for food. Yeah, no, I remember it was also really cool. Um, and then if Pasquale ever listens to this, he'll probably remember that night that in the training camp, 
when we went to a tequila bar in Oda, yeah. like that was, it felt to me like super random. But again, I don't know because obviously that was my first time in Japan. So it was something new. But then we met the uh, a really cool guy, Motoshi, and he invited us to to do a lot of cool things uh, around Doita and he he has like his own restaurant. So I, I I remember that like it was really cool, but also really like random and spontaneous. And hopefully we like you don't get in trouble and we don't get in trouble that we went <laughs> no, out we're to fine. the park. But <laughs> No, Japan yeah. is, you know, it's very diverse. Um, you know, it's we're very open to other cultures and you know foreigners um there's yeah. so, so many different restaurants it's not just japanese food we have great italian food you know uh great spanish food you know all this kind of different cultures mixed into one country as well so if people yeah. can come visit it's, you know great opportunity yeah no i i for sure japan was was amazing and i was really really excited for Tokyo to, to happen. I know obviously if I qualified it would have been amazing to participate in, in those Olympics, but even not just to watch it and, and just to see how how everything was. I, I feel like a lot of people were looking forward to that. Uh, which kind of leads me to, to my next question is like how did you and maybe your teammates or like in general the environment around you how did japan cope with the news of the olympics being postponed you know a few months ago when the whole corona stuff started happening and like how are people now preparing for tokyo 2021 and do you think it'll actually happen like do you have hope so yeah um uh, there were many questions, so I'm going to start there with was. the first one. <laughs> uh, when it first, yeah, when we found out it got postponed, right, was it mid-March yeah. after uh, Luxembourg? And it was kind of funny because uh, I got back to Japan. Rest of, rest of my teammates, so they went to Italy for a training camp um, in between the competitions. I had to come back here because I was uh, rehabbing my injury. Mm. And it was a Monday, and I leave the next day, Tuesday, because we leave a little bit early. Yeah. So Tuesday to go to Budapest. And it was a Monday. I have all my bags ready, all packed up, you know, just uh, I think it was like middle of the day on Monday. And I go into the training center to get rest of my stuff. And my one of the coaches comes up to me and says, uh, everything's uh, Budapest is canceled. Oh, wow. Everything is postponed. And I'm just like, in my mind in the beginning, I was like, dang like we're so close to, like one more turn for you know to determine who qualifies or not um i really want to go and compete you know that was my initial thought i was like come yeah. on let's just let's just do it, it we're like it's not even a week away months. right yeah let's just do it but um i think after we heard news from you know i guess that there was an epa grand prix or world cup and the, there was a couple positive tests and then you hear all yeah. these numbers from countries shutting down and all this you know death especially in italy because we heard you know italy was a dramatic uh number in the beginning then i kind of took a step back and i was like man this is more than fencing this is more than sports um uh, i think health is health and safety is the first thing we should prioritize Absolutely. so um yeah i mean i i think it was the right definitely the right decision and personally, I was dealing with the injury since December. And so I kind of took it, a, took advantage of it. And I was like, okay, everything's postponed. So, you know, I was kind of like, I didn't have time to heal because we, you know, you know, the schedule, we kind of do a competition. And then like two weeks, three weeks later, we have another competition. So right. I couldn't really sit around and like recover. I had to keep training. And so this gave me an opportunity to kind of just like step back, focus on my recovery. And get better yeah and so it's kind of a blessing in the disguise for me i think um because then i was like okay when the competition does restart i can be 100 mm percent -hmm. and so yeah i mean it kind of gave me a something to like focus on which is my recovery um, yeah but you know it definitely was difficult you kind of almost felt like lonely in a way because we like couldn't really train or compete you know, everyone started going lockdown. We had a lockdown for about two months. I know that's yeah. not like, oh, wow. that's, two that's, months, yeah. that's nothing compared to everyone else for sure. Uh, yeah. You know, 
definitely like I have on the good side, blessed side of that. But um, it was kind of refreshing to kind of step away from fencing because you know I've been focused on fencing for the last four years, doing it professionally. Yeah. So just thinking about fencing twenty four seven, you know, it kind of get exhausting. Even though I was enjoying it, it was kind of tiring me out. Yeah. A little bit. And so take a step back. Uh, it allowed my body to be refreshed, recover, and all that. So um, I don't know. It was kind of a nice mind restart of a mindset when I did start training again in June. Yeah. And. I, yeah, think I think with my teammate, I think they had the same mindset too. I think they were devastated in the beginning, but it allowed them to kind of refresh, you know, restart when we did start training again. Yeah, and that's what I basically like the general consensus around the whole fencing community based on the interviews that I've done previously and, you know, just hearing people talk and even just having posts on social media is that yes it was really tough at the beginning at the same time uh it was also kind of nice to have a little break and to like you said if you had injuries there was many people even myself like have small injuries here and there gave us a perfect time a little opportunity a window to recover more than normal like we usually would have had in the normal season if it just went through uh, so those are obviously some positives but then again, at the same point, where it's been too long now. It's almost a whole year yeah. at this point that we haven't had a official uh, FIE World Cup, uh, even like a warm up competition, even even like a satellite, like something. Uh, which is so. I think we are we're all in that boat of like, let's go. We're ready. We had our break. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> but but let's go. So how how do you see uh how do you see japan getting ready for to like this upcoming summer do you and do you again uh i'm sorry i i jumped i bunched all these questions at the beginning to you together so you probably forgot but how how are you do you feel you have hope for tokyo 2021 do you have hope for the olympics actually going through or yeah i mean i think it's gonna happen i mean we had um i think the ioc and also JOC, the Japanese Olympic Committee, they said mm -hmm. we're going through with the Olympics no matter what. And so that's great news. But to what capacity would they going to hold the Olympics? I have no idea. Are yeah. they going to do no audience, just, you know, just the competition itself? Are they going to do 50% capacity for the audience? I have no idea. That's, I think we won't, they won't even know that until closer to the date. But, um, yeah, I think they're going to have it for sure. I think financially they need to have it. Uh, Olympics yeah. brings in so much money for the country, for, you know, television and all that. Um, and then we, Japan has already put in so much in terms of uh, structure, building all these new buildings, um, apartments and all that. So they really need to host it. And so I'm confident they'll have it. Just not sure how exactly they'll have it. I don't think it'll be, It'll be a unique Olympics for sure. It won't be like yeah. the usual, you know, every other Olympics we ever seen on TV. Um, I'm just hoping there will be audience. Um, you know, I'm com you know, I'm confident I'll qualify, and then if I do compete there, I want people to be there and watching. Yeah, um, I don't want to be my. I don't want it to be my first Olympics and have no one there watching. Or or virtual virtual. Yeah, fans. I mean, if it if it happens like that, you know, that's fine. But okay. I do want I, I do want my family and friends to enjoy this experience as well. So exactly. Um, yeah, but you know, I'm very hopeful it will happen. I'm training like it's gonna happen. So uh, that's something that's out of my control. I can't really control it. So I'm just, yeah, all yeah. I can do is you know focus every day, train, and get better. Yeah, and I think that's the, the the best mindset to be in. And again, fingers crossed, fingers crossed that you know it it, it does go through. There's hundreds of thousands of or thousands of athletes that are preparing and, and and hoping and and you know have been training and have had this goal. Some as mm -hmm. you know me, you and I uh, as a first Olympic experience. Others potentially as their last one. They just yeah. want to finish yeah. their athletic chapter. So. It really, really would be a shame because a lot of generations of 
of athletes, Spencers and, and everybody, you know, if it doesn't happen would, would be would be terrible. So fingers crossed. Hopefully it does happen. It sounds from what you said that you're ready, that Japan is ready and, and they're excited. So that that's that's great news. Yeah. Changing the changing gears a little bit, you know, I think it's you know, we, we relate in a way that we've switched nationalities and now we we compete and we represent uh, our dual an, another another nation. So can you tell us a little bit how uh, about your transition? How was it switching from the United States? Um, because you were on the junior team, correct me if I'm wrong, yep. but you made a junior team. So you have represented the United States at the international level. Uh, how was the, the switching period? How, how was there any difficulties, pros, minuses? Tell us a little bit about switching from US to Japan. Okay, yeah. Um, so I s officially switched uh, in the summer of 2015 after I finished my junior year of college at Penn State. And before that, you know, I, I was fencing for the US for the junior, you know, junior world team, cadet, all that. And thing was, I think it was 2014 after I won NCAA championship. And I also aged out of juniors. Um, I kind of was trying to think ahead what I wanted to do in my fencing career. I wasn't really sure about the Olympics. You know, I was fencing college. And a lot of times in the U.S., after they graduate from college, they, you know, most of them retire. And so I was thinking, do I take that path and go, you know, get a career, get, you know, get a real job? Or do I you know, fence professionally and go for the Olympics. And, you know, obviously U.S. was in my head in the beginning, but I also, you know, my mom's from Japan and she always loved the fact that for me to fence for Japan. Mm -hmm. And I've had, you know, I've done Japanese competition when I was younger and they always seemed interested in me joining them. And so I took a year off and from international competition. So that junior year, 2014, 2015 season, I only, okay. I only did a uh, collegiate level tournaments. And so that gave me time to really think what I wanted to do in the fencing career. And so after my junior year, that's when I decided, okay, I want to go for the Olympics and I want to fence for Japan. Um, just because 20, you know, I wanted to, first I wanted to go for 2016 in Rio yeah, not like a trial, but my main focus was 2020, and it was in t uh, Tokyo. So for me to represent Japan for the Tokyo Olympics, I just I just thought that was like a big deal, you know. Yeah. Instead of going, for, instead of fencing for US and going to Tokyo, and so that's why I made the switch that summer, and the process was fairly easy for me personally. I know I've heard stories from other uh, fencers. Switching's been very difficult from countries to country. I luckily had a very good relationship, not only with the Japanese Federation, but also the U.S. Federation, the U.S. Uh, president at the time, Don Anthony, the head coach of the Sabre team, um, Zoran. I've had yeah. really good relationship with all of them. And so when I... You know, because you kind of have to, it's like a, you have to get permission from the U.S. For me, get permission from the U.S. Fe uh, Federation to release me and then have the Japanese Federation accept me. And also the FIEs in the middle saying, okay, okay, this is all clear. Yeah. So it could get very ugly, you know, if one country doesn't want to release you and all that. But luckily, when I asked, you know, the U.S. Federation, they happily released me and... FIE took notice of that, and the Japanese Federation accepted me. And so I think I, the process was like less than a week, <laughs> to be honest. It was like oh, boom, boom, a couple emails, sad. it all finished, and I was like, oh, I'm a Japanese fencer. And yeah. so that's like very lucky situation for me. I've heard people not be able to fence internationally for years. Um, yeah. I heard really bad stories. So. I was kind of nervous at first, but I think having a good relationship with people and, you know, federation wise, it helped me a lot.
Yeah, and did you you had to have a, a passport or, or something? But well, you were born in Japan. As yeah, well, yeah, so I, I was a dual su- uh, citizen, so yeah, that, that was not a problem. Yeah, because when I when I switched to Argentina, I, it took a little bit longer than one week. Luckily, again, it wasn't uh, there wasn't any issues because I was actually representing Bulgaria before I switched to Argentina. Uh, but the Bulgarian Federation was like, okay, do whatever you want to do. Uh, we'll just sign what we need to sign. But the Argentine Federation and and the, the the coaches and the team managers and everything, they really wanted me to switch. So um, you know, I just had to wait for for the documents for my yeah, passport. Yeah. ID card, but other than that, everything was smooth. So that that was also good. Have you had? Have you ever encountered though any difficulties with communication with your teammates? Maybe at the beginning with your coaches. Like, how's your Japanese uh, language skills? Or have like obviously they probably improved, but how was it at the beginning? I mean, at the beginning, um, yeah, obviously my Japanese wasn't great. Um, it's gotten a lot better since moving here. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily the language barrier. I think it was more of the cultural. Um, I didn't really understand. And J- Japanese is very strict in like the c- culture in terms of like how you talk to people that's you know older than you or you know higher. You no, know, I guess when you're talking to coaches and all that, I kind of knew the basic way of talking. I didn't know like the proper way in a way. So. You know, I wasn't trying to do it on purpose. It was just a lack of knowledge and experience and uh, of the culture. So, um, and I, I think they, they understood that, you know, I wasn't a real Japanese person. So um, I think they kind of just laughed it off or just didn't take it too seriously or personal. I mean, yeah. I appreciated that. But um, yeah, I mean, it's tough because I was still in, living in the U.S., still going to college. So I wasn't really, you know, I only saw my Japanese teammates at competitions. Yeah, and yeah. It's hard to get to know them just in that short period of time, and For sure. and also at the same time, the language barrier. I can't communicate with them hundred percent. So, you know, all I did was, you know, what I focused on was just competing and trying to get the best results for myself and my team. Um, that was my main focus, and I think they knew how hard I worked and how you know how serious I was and how big of a competitor i was so i think that's how i kind of got accepted in a way yeah um yeah and i think you know the more i you know the the years it's been you know what five years since i joined you know we've come closer and closer and you know i've gotten better at speaking japanese so i think our relationship relationship has built to be a better relationship i think yeah no that that's awesome and i think again that that the most important thing, obviously, as athletes, is like our performance and our professionalism. So if we show that you know we're here to win and to help the team, that whatever team that we're on, that we're gonna give it like our all. I think they really appreciate that, and and not just your teammates, but like everybody around you, the coaching staff, the federation, everything. They see that and they acknowledge that. And through the years, your uh, team chemistry and your bonding, you guys get closer together. I can say that firsthand as well is the same with the Argentine national team. At the beginning, my skill, my language was very, very minimal. Uh, as all only from what I learned from reggaeton and you know just the curse words I knew <laughs> in Spanish. Uh, so yeah, but through the years, it's it's gotten better. But you you mentioned college a few times already. And we know you grew up in the state, you know, born in Japan, but then you started really your fencing career in the States. So could you tell us how has it, you know, your journey, your fencing journey, working with different coaches at different clubs on the different stages at the club, the national, the international level? um, How have those experiences been working with different coaches, with different teammates? And like, what was the impact? they they left like how did that help you throughout your career i mean yeah i mean i've had shoot like i've had like six seven different coaches um in my career and you know they all came in different parts of my uh like fencing career and they helped me develop as a fencer and so you know, I think most important thing is 
you personally realizing if that coach can help take help you take it to the next level or not mm-hmm. if they can't you have to you know find a different coach and hopefully you know you can get leave that current coach and find a new coach in a good term um, and i hope that coach understands that as well but um thankfully my situation you know was you know my coach is understood or I, I had to move locations so i had to find a new coach but um I think the key is finding, you know, you're not going to agree with every coach. You're not going to, you're not going to find the perfect coach. You just have to absorb what they can teach you. Maybe what they teach you doesn't work hundred percent of the time. That's fine. You just, you know, use the stuff that works and just, uh, I want to say throw away the stuff that doesn't work, but you know, just keep it to the side. Um, and you know, there are some coaches that try to completely change your style. But you got to have, you know, realize what works and what doesn't and have your own style. Um, yeah, I mean, all the coaches I had, they had a huge impact in my fencing career. I wouldn't I wouldn't credit one person to be the, you know, the main coach that got me here. You know, they all had part of it. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm blessed to have a great, you know, not just coaches, but mentors throughout my life yeah yeah no that's that's awesome and i think it's it, it's really important uh you know it, it is special if you're lucky enough to have one coach or like you know one or two coaches your entire career you can really build a relationship we've talked um with uh with Fares and with john southfield who's the national coach of, of gb that like yes you know compared to other sports you know in fencing people tend to stick with one or two coaches for the majority of their career. Or as in tennis, you know, you see the Federer's and Djokovic's training, uh, training with new coaches almost every season or every few seasons. So, but I do think it's, it's, it's very beneficial as well. Uh, and like you said, to acknowledge once to, to learn and to take the maximum out of everybody that, that you're working with. And once, you know, there is unfortunately a, a ceiling, a limit, so once you realize that and once you've achieved the maximum from that one coach or whatever, I do think it, it's, you know, you shouldn't be afraid to go and, and maybe learn something new and, and, and get new styles and new tactics. And yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, if, if one coach works for you, that, that's great. Like, I wouldn't tell you not to, uh, I wouldn't tell you to leave that coach. I mean, that's great too. But I, for me, I love to learn new things and yeah. having different coaches allow me to, you know, in offensive way, learn new skills, new actions, new develop new weapons in my fencing style and kind of just mold me in a better fencer, you know, kind of adapt all their styles and teaching. And yeah. kind of like, I kind of took that and made my own style out of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. If if you're a fencer that you know goes to one coach and completely does his that person's style, and then goes to a different coach and then changes your style completely, you're just gonna be lost in your fencing. Yeah. I think you just have to be able to kind of you know pick the pros of each coaches and kind of build your own. You know, it's kind of like a video game character, your character, and try to maximize your ability. Yeah, I think that's that's a cool cool metaphor. Uh, what, what do you think? I'm just, you know, this just came to me. What, what is special about the Japanese mentality, the Japanese coaches, the Asian coaches? Cause you also guys, you were working with the former Korean national coach, uh, for many years, he's been in Japan now. Uh, so like, how, is it really, really different? Like, is your training structure super different than, uh, than in the States? Like, w- yeah, I'm just really interested to, to hear about that. Um, yeah, I mean, like the, you know, in the States, it's more, um, I wouldn't, it's not laid back, but it's more up to you how you schedule your training, mm-hmm. right? Obviously, you have your club practices, but outside of that, you can schedule your lessons at different times or your weight training, blah, blah, blah. It's more individual needs, right? Yeah. Um, whereas in Japan, we all train, the team trains together at the coach's uh, schedule, right? He sets the schedule and we train together all the time, which is great because yeah. it takes your mind off. I don't have to set my schedule, you know, it's already there. But um, what 
with the Japanese team and especially the um, the culture is very, we're very disciplined and hardworking. Um, you know, whatever the coaches say, we say yes, sir, and we do it. And so we're very disciplined uh, athletes, people. And so, you know, a lot of countries actually say we train too much, which could be yeah. true. But, um, I mean, that's kind of built in our DNA. And we just, you know, even like the work, the businessman and like the working people are very hardworking people. You know, salary men. You know, they yeah. work from the morning to late at night. That's how Japanese people are. And so, yeah. as an athlete, I think it's just a normal thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, like, uh, like you said, you know, Asian fencers. We have we typically have a different style than European fencers. Um, yeah. Same with the Japanese, you know, fencers. I think we emphasize more on uh, foot footwork and leg movement. You know, speed. Mm -hmm. In terms of that so yeah we did a lot of you know footwork and especially our coach is korean so he kind of brings that korean style to our fencing as well yeah which is which is awesome and it, it, we've also seen though as well especially you know even this past weekend the sunday cup um and you know you've posted many many awesome dope videos from your previous national championships so like there's these super crazy, technologically advanced, very well organized, or at least that's how they look, the uh, national competitions, Asian competitions. How, how, tell us a little bit, how has been the feeling competing in those types of competitions? And do you, would you suggest as a representative of the fencing community to the FIE or, or anything, do you think the FIE can learn from you guys or to, to make our sport, make the fencing circuit more watchable, more enjoyable as a, as a spectator and as an athlete? Yeah, I mean, I'm spoiled in terms of what we, the technology we can use here at our, you know, national competition. I mean, Yuki Ota, um, the legend himself, he's been organizing all this, you know, how he, he's been trying to make it, make fencing more viewable for regular audience. So he tried to incorporate all these technology to somehow, you know, illustrate you know after each touch how how each fencers are moving slow motion with the lights to help the audience understand what's going on because you know fencing so fast and so he's done a great job doing it every year it's gone better and better um in terms of technology um <laughs> unfortunately like the, the three years i mean he did it this year but the three years he you know i was when the technology was the highest i was in the finals so i couldn't really watch what was happening because i was competing yeah. and so hey, uh, i mean that's not a bad sign right but um um you know it's amazing for sure uh and i definitely want to definitely want fie to incorporate the same technology but i understand it's very expensive yeah um, i don't know fencing is not a big you know money sport so i don't know if i fie can incorporate that technology every tournament you know yeah. if, if they can do every tournament that's great because then we can definitely raise the viewership in terms of yeah. fencing because you know fencing is such a it's a very fun sport to watch but it's very difficult to understand because it's so fast and there's so many rules and so that's the only problem about why you know that's the problem why fencing isn't a big sport you know just understanding the rules and it's just too fast and so with this technology, it helps regular audience. They might not understand the rules, but it kind of slows down, and they can really see what the each movement, especially the blade where it's moving, and they can yeah. you know if you explain the rules in between before the match, they can kind of you know connect the dots. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm hoping, especially in the Japanese country, the you know, in the country of Japan. In the Olympics, we incorporate this technology during the Olympics, and people who haven't seen fencing will watch it for the first time. And not only will they enjoy it, they'll maybe start to understand the sport. Yeah. And I think that'll bring a big boom in terms of the sport, and more people will definitely try it. Yeah. Um, and so, and I know that in, even in Japanese championship, when I've met plenty of people after competition 
and they come up to me or they come up to other people and they're like, this is my first fencing tournament I've ever seen. I don't even know what fencing is. This is me first time watching it. And it's so cool. I kind of yeah. understand a little bit now. And I was like, yeah. that's awesome. You know, that's really, it means a lot. Um, so, I mean, hopefully if I can somehow incorporate a little bit of it. I, uh, I think, yeah. If, I really think they, sh they should uh, embrace embrace things that will make um you know even little steps okay we're not saying you, we have to have video replay everywhere we have to have the this laser tracing technology at every single competition but i do believe um that we really should have more of a professionalized circuit a little bit more of a consistent circuit because you know we go to competitions all over the world and every year even if it's in the same country the the circumstances are different the venue may change uh, the 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 times of the pools, like everything is is very randomized, which makes the professionalism of fencing difficult. Because yeah. you know, like you have tennis tournaments every year, it's at the same venue every year. They have the same format, the same structure, uh, the same qual criteria for qualification, everything like Formula One, all these things like. They're the same stuff. So you, as a as an athlete, as an individual, we know how to prepare and what to expect, which is what makes fencing difficult. But uh, you know, so I think it's really cool to see these new technologies uh, being implemented. There is that argument that with too much technology, you know, it takes away from the sport. Like we've seen, like that video replays in soccer or football. Uh, it's it's controversial in tennis with the Hawkeye, you know, with the challenges it, here and there. It's it's been good. Do you do you think that having more technology would be a plus or a minus? You, like, you, would you want to see more of it? Do you think fencing can benefit from it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's right now. I mean, more will be better, but yeah, like you said you don't want to slow down the pace of the sport right um yeah if you incorporate more slow mo uh video replays you know slow motion like after each touch you let the audience see in slow motion that takes away the uh the not only the speed of the competition but also the athletes emotion and like the momentum and everything too so yeah. you don't want to ruin the performance but you know it's for me yeah technology should be increased but i think we need to somehow increase the amount of you know spectators to come to the tournament right or show mm -hmm. it more on tv yeah. with you know someone commentating more for the normal people watching that don't know, understand the rules so really like um explain the rules after each touch or kind of bring sense of humor or something uh -huh. um, just show it on tv more often and then somehow invite people to come to a competition so if it's a world cup right if the host country is hungry you know they usually hungry does a good job of bringing more people to the audience but maybe um uh, that's a bad example maybe say we had a tournament in mexico you know try to somehow influence promote it there and you know i don't know how to bring people but like try yeah. to bring more people to come watch and be like look at this fencing you know maybe say if you come we'll give you a free gift i don't know something yeah um, and then somehow televise it uh not just in mexico but throughout the world um make it more available for people around the world watching because you know you know us like some of the competition it's like the links to the competition you can't even find or you can't even exactly. watch yeah uh, it's difficult um yeah. and we're living in 2020 we should be able to do that no problem i'm not yeah. asking to have this crazy technology that i'm you know i've been able to experience in a japanese championship but at least start by being the competition be except you know be able to watch, yeah on computer or youtube easily yeah so and that I, could I be think, a start yeah we've seen we've seen that getting a little bit better but you know there's still such a far long way to go forward and it I, I i i couldn't help but laugh but just like trying to find the links to the videos has been even even like you know 
it's it's ridiculous. You want to see the live results, but you can't because it redirects you four million times. <laughs> yeah, you you go to FIE and it tells you this link, and you go to this yeah. link, and then it takes you a different website. It's like, oh no, you got to go to this. It's like, what the hell? Just have it yeah. on one spot. Yeah, no, it's 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 ridiculous, but definitely something that should be should be worked upon. Uh, Anyway, we'll, we'll, last question I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, Kaido. It's been a while uh, that we've been chatting and it's been really cool, really interesting. But could you just share with us briefly what's been like a really, your most memorable, memorable, funny, crazy, uh, either fencing result or memory? Uh, and yeah, just share it with us. I think it'll be a cool way, a nice way to, to end. Yeah, so. Um... My biggest, I guess, results in term like memory in terms of results has been being able to win the Japanese championship, not just one but twice. Um, but I think the best and most memorable experience I've had is especially when after winning those championship, just being able to interact with the fans, um, not just fans of fencing, but just regular people who came to watch fencing for the first time. Um, and for them to say that they're inspired and they love the sport of fencing because they were able to watch the event and watch me fence, that means a lot to me, you know, yeah. you know, I've focused so much on good, you know, getting great results and all that, but my second goal is also to promote what, what I love to do, which is fencing. And so if I can make fencing a more of a popular sport, that means a lot to me. And so in those moments, talking to those fans, inspiring not just kids, but adults to try fencing or appreciate fencing, uh, that means a lot. And, you know, my goal, hopefully my biggest accomplishment or, you know, experience will be the Olympics uh, in Tokyo. And yeah. hopefully, you know, I do well there and also be able to promote the sport of fencing and make it you know a more of a popular sport in japan and have more people try it that, that would mean a lot to me and so i'm looking forward to it awesome well yeah we really i mean i think all fencers really appreciate those who make the effort really to to get our sport out there start you know whatever it takes whatever methods uh, just just to encourage more people to try it and, and to know what fencing is, not just to have people, you know, be like, oh, do you poke each other? Yeah. Or, you know, <laughs> do, you, do you build fences or whatever, you know, those those typical fencer jokes that every common person, common person, <laughs> every, every non-fencer uh, makes to us. So, yeah, and again, man, uh, really hoping and going to be cheering for, for you to, to qualify for Tokyo and cheering for the Japanese team. You guys are a really exciting uh, group of, of fencers. I think it's whatever the format, whatever happens for Tokyo, I still think it's going to be an amazing Olympic Games. Uh, and, and hopefully it will be, it'll be uh, the first uh, of many for you and going to be cheering for you all the way. So thank you again. Thanks, Kaido, for taking the time, um, despite the time difference, uh, and for sharing sharing your stories, your experiences, your memories, and, and everything with us on our Sport Bite Fencing podcast. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And no, thank you, Stefano. And I'll be cheering for you too, man. I want to compete with you at the Tokyo Olympics. You know, I want you to be on that stage as well. So I'll be rooting thank for you. you. You know, you know, and hopefully afterwards we party, you know, in Tokyo, you know. Absolutely. I have nothing, I have nothing to say bad about Oita. You know, Oita is a great city, but, you know, Tokyo is a different beast. And I would love, you know, people to experience, you know, Tokyo. So hopefully we compete, yeah. do well, and then we party after. So I'm looking forward hey, to that. Too. I think I think that's the way us suburbs <laughs> always think, you know, work hard, play hard. Uh, <laughs> but, you know. From now, from now, I'll tell you that's a great idea. Start thinking of what the kilobars to hit and oh what. Oh my uh, god! Well, if it's open, right? If it, you know, we gotta yeah. socially be responsible. You know, wear a mask and all that. But uh, hopefully, it opens up and uh, we can enjoy 
the life, you know, or go back to our regular lives pretty much. So hopefully. yeah. 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 Again, thank you, Kaido. Uh, I hope to see you soon at a, at a competition to finish off our, our qualification. And thanks again for the chat. Everybody follow, subscribe and uh, keep tuning in uh, for amazing guests like Kaito and like the ones we've previously seen. Uh, so yeah, thank you again. Arigatou gozaimasu. Gozaimasu. <laughs> <laughs>